welcome to Telesur. This is from the south, from Caracas, Venezuela. I'm Carla Gonzalez. Let's begin. We have the latest figures for the key election of the midterms in the United States. For the Senate, 42 seats went to the Democrats and 50 for the Republicans who are keeping this majority. The House of Representatives, the majority, goes for the Democrats with 176 seats against 170 for the Republicans. And for the governors, 16 went for the Democrats when 21 went for the Republicans. These, of course, are preliminary numbers, and we will be reporting the final results as they come. And today's midterm elections have seen a massive voter turnout. These are the first national elections since Donald Trump won the presidency in 2016. With his hardline policies and constant attacks on migrants, today the country is more divided than ever. At a stake are all 435 seats in the House of Representatives and 35 seats in the 100-member Senate. 36 governor's posts are also up for grabs, along with seats in state legislatives across the country. Opinion polls favor Democrats to capture a majority in the House of De Representatives, and they suggest that Republicans will likely retain their majority in the Senate. This election is going to switch the Senate and the House seats. So if we can get a Democratic um, turnout, then we can help overrule some of the things that Donald Trump says and does. With all the uh, issues that are happening across the country and the negative uh, energy coming out of Washington and this president, it's great to see someone like Beto who has great energy, great enthusiasm, positive, great message. And projected winner in New York for the House of Representatives, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, is seen as a symbol of a new wave of democratic socialists trying to push for progressive government policies. Oh, well, I, I am proudly running as a Democrat, and I anticipate and, and really look forward to uh, collaborating as much as we can as, as a party in order to make sure that uh, we get a progressive agenda realized. It's not necessary to have representatives who take money from corporations, but we can have officials who only work for the people in the community. Now let's look at that first migrant caravan that has arrived to Mexico City after 18 days of walking. The caravan left the city of Córdoba in the state of Veracruz towards Mexico City. The migrants started walking at 5 a.m. just like the caravan assembly agreed on. The migrants walk to a highway that crosses three states and that heads to the capital. Some boarded some vehicles to move faster. I am a little tired, but every day we move closer is a day we have to thank God for. Others walk to avoid the cramped trucks. The caravan traveled 230 kilometers to reach its next destination. Near the toll collection booths, the federal police help some migrants hop on some cars. Once in Mexico City, they walk to a shelter in the municipality of Pizzacalco. We need water and baby supplies. Also, I would ask people to help with food and milk, especially for the younger ones. We have nothing to take care of babies. After 18 days, the migrant caravan has traveled for 1,180 kilometers on their way to the border with the United States. In total, over 4,500 Central American migrants have arrived to Mexico. The city's government has set up a temporary shelter at a sports stadium where they have received food, medical attention and clothes. The group is reportedly considering how long they'll stay in Mexico City before starting to once again walk towards the United States. The closest border crossing from their current location is nearly 800 kilometers away. We're heading to the U.S. Let's have faith in God that we are able to enter, even if Donald Trump says he won't let us in. Some of us have to get through. We all want the American dream. 
Over a period of five years, nearly 60,000 unaccompanied minors have migrated in Honduras. According to children's rights organizations, there haven't been policies from the government to safeguard these children. According to statistics, nearly 30% of the people who travel in the migrant caravans headed to the U.S. are children, almost all accompanied by one of their parents. Their testimonies say the state does not offer opportunities. In our country, there is nothing. We have children, we have a family, we have parents. I come from the island of Roatan. Everything there is expensive. Electricity, rent. We are only working to pay for rent. According to children rights defenders, migration is an extreme decision, which is usually taken when their life is threatened. It's not only extreme poverty that is forcing people to leave, it's also violence. But if we had a state that protected people, they would find shelter. The problem is that even before threats, before murders, before extortions, people have no place to go. Criminalization of young people by the government is added to living in poverty. If you live under poverty line, you are seen as a potential gang member. For starters, there is political criminalization of the youth. Young people are seen as a problem, not as people who are being excluded and marginalized from the system. Therefore, while there are politics of that nature, then what we're going to have is young people who want to leave the country. The absence of opportunities for jobs for adults adds greater vulnerability to minors, who are often left to be cared by third parties without access to basic living conditions. Many parents are forced to look for jobs in other municipalities or in other countries. So children are growing up vulnerable and facing different types of violence because not having the right to free education is a form of violence. From January to June 2018, 124 children were displaced in Honduras due to the threats from gangs in their communities. We have more stories coming up, but be sure to follow us on Twitter at Telesur English and my account at Carla G. Telesur. So give us a follow, give us some retweets and some hearts as well. We'll be back. Welcome back. Grenada, as well as Antigua and Barbuda, voted in referendums today. They decided not to use the Caribbean Court of Justice as their final appeal court. 
according to preliminary results, with close to 51%. They will continue to use the British Privy Council instead of the Caribbean institution. Our correspondent brings us more details about this vote. People in two Caribbean countries have voted to retain the London-based Privy Council as their final Court of Appeal. Voters in Antigua and Barbuda and also Grenada headed to the polls on Tuesday to determine whether to replace the British body with the Caribbean Court of Justice, the CCJ. Just under half of people in each country voted in favour of adopting the CCJ. Decades have passed since independence for the two countries and for many, using the CCJ is seen as a matter of regional pride and an important step towards breaking age-old colonial ties. Advocates say the CCJ, which travels between the Caribbean islands, offers greater access to justice as the cost of travel to London could be prohibitive. Critics fear political interference in the judicial process and a lack of impartiality among judges in small Caribbean nations. It's now 13 years since the CCJ heard its first case, but to date only four countries have officially adopted it. They are Dominica, Guyana, Barbados and Belize. Gemma Handy, Telesur, Antigua. The president of Cuba, Miguel Diaz Canel, is in China to strengthen commercial and technological ties. During his visit to Beijing, he will sign agreements on trade, renewable energy and in the cooperation of the Belt and Road Initiative. He said this was an opportunity for developing countries. China is the fourth stop on Diaz Canel's first tour since he became president in April. Former Vice President of Ecuador Jorge Glass is in a crisis due to his deteriorating health conditions after a hunger strike. His lawyer Eduardo Franco said he is still waiting to be taken to a clinic. Glass was protesting that he was transferred to a high security prison as part of political retaliation by the government of Ecuador. Peru's commission that looked into the car wash corruption scandal has accused former presidents Pedro Pablo Kuczynski and Ollanta Humala of alleged crimes. During the reading of the Congressional Investigating Commission's final report, Congresswoman Rosa Bartra said there is evidence that shows that former President Kuczynski may have been involved in money laundering during his time as finance minister. On the other hand, former President Humala is reportedly linked to illegal transfer of funds for the H2 Olmos company, which is a subsidiary of Odebrecht. In Brazil, after announcing the possible merge of the Agriculture and Environment Ministries, President-elect Jair Bolsonaro has said that his government won't support giving land to indigenous people because he says that that will put landlords at risk. I have said that if it's up to me, we will not have more demarcations of indigenous lands in Brazil because we have an indigenous area greater than the southeast region. The landlords cannot wake up and discover that through a decision of the executive they will lose their own property to a new indigenous land. Now the topics, France has given refugee status to former Chilean guerrilla member Ricardo Palma Salamanca, even after the Chilean government had asked for his extradition. Salamanca has been a fugitive for over 20 years after being sentenced for the murder of a senator. Friends and family members of Ricardo Palma Salamanca are celebrating. They say that political asylum his wife and children have received will end with two decades of persecution and will let them live in peace. They are grateful that French institutions have listened to them. France is a country where institutional powers are totally transparent and separate. In his meeting with French President Emmanuel Macron last October, Chilean President Sebastián Piñera asked for the extradition of the former guerrilla member. We talk about Palma Salamanca. What Chile wants is very simple. We want him back in Chile where he was judged and sentenced for terrorism. In April 1991, Ricardo Palma Salamanca, a former member of the Manuel Rodríguez Patriotic Front, killed Senator Jaime Guzmán, one of the collaborators in Augusto Pinochet's dictatorship. 
Few times people have had access to justice, real justice. Through Ricardo, we can have some dignity, because who Ricardo killed, if Pinochet were Hitler, the men Ricardo killed would be Goebbels. Guzman was the brains behind the massacre of Chilean people. The dictatorship was a two-headed dragon, one civilian head, one military. I lost my parents. Who is to say that Jaime Guzmán was not the one who planned my mother's murder? Palma was sentenced to life imprisonment, but in 1996 he escaped from a high-security prison in a helicopter. Since then, authorities have been trying to bring him back to Chile. We strongly believe there were violations of due process and of human rights, including torture, during Ricardo Palma Salamanca's trial. Right-wing and left-wing parties are outraged by Palma's asylum. Many went to the French embassy in Santiago to leave a letter of complaint. We are asking the French government to revise the situation. We don't know all the French institutions. We understand the institution that approved his asylum has members designated by the French government. So we think it is evident that something can be done. Despite the fact the French government has made its decision, Chileans lawmakers still hope to see Palma Salamanca extradited. Now to Argentina. A new round of layoffs is threatening just under 200 workers at the country's Channel 9. During Mauricio Macri's government, unions have denounced cutbacks in television programs, which have resulted in even more layoffs. President Macri says his economic adjustments made during the first three years of his government have caused the unemployment rate to jump to 9.6 percent, the highest in 12 years. But workers' unions disagree. The 17th Arts and Special Education Science Fair has taken place in Argentina's capital, Buenos Aires. Children and adults from various special education schools got to showcase their talents. 700 children with special needs took part in the Arts and Special Education Science Fair. It was a magical moment filled with joy when they got to take the stage. This is just a glimpse of what disabled people can achieve if their health care and education are strong. You can see many different schools with kids with different conditions. This experience is a way of labor, education, art, inclusion. This is their time to shine through the singing, dancing and theater plays. The performance is celebrated by their parents, teachers and the general audience attending the event. Here they can show everything they've learned and what they can do. At a time when there are several judgments and right violations, it's important to keep this space open for them. These schools are proving that they can give these children equal chances by equipping them with the knowledge and skills to perform. It's intense, the kids are nervous. They've prepared for six months. It must have been the same for every participant. It's very exciting. Discrimination against them is huge, so it's good for them to participate here. This is a very nice experience. He's relaxed and it gives him confidence. It is an expression for and it's good for him to break stereotypes and to feel free. The stage of the Coliseo Theater has seen many performances. This event is organized by the Infancias Foundation to mark the 29th anniversary of the Declaration of Children's Rights by the General Assembly of the UN. We'll be back after this last short break, but stay with us.
continue with news. The Saudi-led coalition has suffered a setback in its offensive against al-Hudaydah in Yemen. The forces of the Revolutionary Committees carried out attacks with the support of drones and artillery pieces. They partly counterbalanced the advances made by the Saudi coalition. Meanwhile, UNICEF has urged all sides to cease fire near hospitals. South Africa's Home Affairs Minister Malusi Gigaba has threatened that there will be hell if he's removed from his post. In an interview, he said the African National Congress is his home and will therefore not take kindly to any attempts to remove him from his party and his cabinet position. There have been numerous calls for him to be fired from both positions after an investigation found that he lied under oath during a corruption scandal. An address given by South African President Cyril Ramaphosa to Parliament had to be suspended for a few minutes after two opposition members of the Parliament exchanged punches. A physical fight broke out between MP Nasir Paulson after he rose on a point of order when Andries Tlowam of the Agang party was speaking. The two members were removed from the House after this fight. And Ramaphosa also dismissed insinuations that farm attacks in the country are racially motivated. Responding to a question from an opposition member of parliament, Ramaphosa said farm murders are happening across racial lines and not only affecting one racial group, as claimed by right-wing organizations. This comes after a tweet in August by U.S. President Donald Trump, where he claimed that white farmers in South Africa were victims of racially motivated attacks. The fact that, yes, white farmers are being killed, including black people on farms are being killed as well, is the reality that we are living with. So the killings, the killings of a number of people in our country is something that concerns me. It should concern all of us. And I will never, I will never sort of categorize it as just saying white. It is people in our country are getting killed. Moving along, Russia and Spain have signed an agreement to reinforce cooperation ties on education and science. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has met his Spanish counterpart, Josep Borrell, to discuss international issues such as the conflicts in Ukraine, the Middle East and Syria. Lavrov also met Spanish King Felipe. In a press conference, Lavrov also criticized the U.S. sanctions imposed against Iran. When it comes to the United States measures addressed to Iran, they are absolutely illegitimate. They are being implemented in front violation by the UN Security Council decisions. The ways in which these measures are announced and implemented can only cause a deep disappointment. We start from the premise that the norms not only of international law but only of international communication remain in force and in no era it's hardly acceptable to follow a policy based on ultimatum and unilateral demands. The foreign minister also ruled out any Russian interference in the midterm elections held in the United States. About the midterm elections that are held today, U.S. officials declared that absence of evidence to show us any interference from Russia on these votes. The election result depends on American voters. We are convinced that domestic disturbances in the United States have a direct impact on Washington-Moscow relations. And our partnership in the global security is so long awaited by many countries that turns out to be hostages to these domestic political disputes in the United States. More than 17 people died when three boats were shipwrecked in the Mediterranean Sea. At least 80 people were rescued in the Alboran Sea, while in Caños de Meca only five migrants were saved. According to the Spanish Maritime Rescue Service, some 13 people died in Alboran 
and for others in Caños, both near the Morocco coast. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has given the go-ahead for lawmakers to advance a bill calling for the death penalty for convicted Palestinians. The controversial bill would allow the Israeli courts to sentence Palestinians charged for terrorist activities to the death penalty. The bill says a simple majority of two to one judges would be enough to impose it. A unique statue of international Egyptian football player Mohamed Salah has been presented at the 2018 World Youth Forum in Egypt. The statue, featuring the striker, has surprise assistance for its oversized head, its skinny legs and a small body. The World Youth Forum is one of the biggest fairs for young people in Africa. It presents art exhibitions and many cultural activities, including related to soccer. And that brings us to the end of this news brief, but as you know, this and many other stories, you can find them on our website at telesurenglish.net. Here you can find all the latest information on the U.S. midterms, elections, and the results and the analysis after the election so far. And you can also follow us on social media. Thank you for watching Telesur, connecting the global south. Until next time.